So it's my great pleasure to introduce Catherine Roder as our first keynote speaker. So I first came across Catherine's work when I was a graduate student, not so very long ago. And um, she'd, uh, I was working on mixture models at the time, mixtures of univariate normal distributions. And Catherine had just published a couple of papers on the topic. And one of the papers had an astronomy data set in it that my, I think my advisor must have pointed me towards it because he was kind of interested in the astronomy at the time. And uh, so I went and looked at the paper and there was the data set in full, all 82 numbers. These were um, velocities of galaxies moving away uh, from us. And um, so that was my first experience with Catherine. She was sharing her data, or actually in this case, someone else's data. Uh, to that, and I, I made use of that in my PhD thesis, all, all 82 numbers. Um, the next time, it wasn't long before I came across her work again, um, the ne so I began to think this wasn't a coincidence at this point. Uh, I guess the next time I really started paying attention was her work on uh, genomic control, which... Uh, involved uh, trying to deal with population stratification and result in what you've probably come across if you've ever done a GWAS as a genomic inflation factor that measures the potential impact of stratification. Very simple idea, very widely used, very useful. So that was, uh, genomic control was moving from 82 numbers to, I guess, uh, a distillation of a GWAS data perhaps on thousands of individuals in hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands of SNPs. So we very rapidly, in the course of about 10 years, went from 82 numbers to, uh, to what you might think of as kind of almost modern day size, size data sets. Um, Catherine has also done, uh, has been intimately involved in work with the Autism Sequencing Consortium to understand the role of de novo mutation in this disease. And when I went back to her CV, she's actually done a whole bunch of things I didn't know anything about or knew relatively little about. Um, I did know about her work on DNA fingerprinting, but not her work on double-blind refereeing, uh, the genetics of IQ. I, and I, did, I was familiar, though, with her work on multiple testing, weighting multiple tests, control of multiple tests, uh, control of FDR. And more recently, she's done a whole bunch of work on single-cell uh, expression data that I think she's going to tell us more about today. What I think is really breathtaking is the variety of different problems that Catherine's worked on. Uh, they're all important, practical problems that arise from a range of different scientific disciplines, mostly in genetics, but not exclusively. Um, it's not surprising that she's been recognized by some very... Uh, prestigious awards. She was awarded, just to select a few, the uh, President's Award by COPS in 1997, the Medallion Lecture of the IMS in 1999, the Janet L. Norwood Award in 2013, and most recently she was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences in 2019. It's a great pleasure to have Catherine come and Tell you about I tell you about her work today. Thank you very much. Let's go. Thank you very much. That was a, a very kind introduction. And I, I have to say about that astronomy data set that what was the greatest about it was first, I got hundreds of citations for that paper. <laughs> and some people actually asked me if I would provide the 82 data points, like they couldn't type them in themselves. <laughs> but, but so um, that, that was kind of a fun thing. But I didn't stick with astronomy very long. Um, so anyway, Anyway, I'm talking today about, um, I'm, it's a great honor to be here and, and give one of the keynotes for this lecture. And uh, one last comment is that I can't believe there wasn't any coffee before my talk. <laughs> but but I, hopefully we'll all make it through and I won't, I won't run over, I promise. So um, I'm going to talk about methods for, uh, statistical methods for analyzing multimodal single cell data. I guess this would have fit naturally in the morning sessions. And um, so 
So the, this kind of data, it's funny because in 2019, it was multi-omic uh, single-cell data was considered the myth of the year. And now, what is that, already out of date? But it's still, still new, enough, new enough to be exciting. And so we get, not only can we measure the transcriptome of the single cell, but we can measure two or even sometimes three different modalities in the same um, cell. And so we want to make the most of it. So in particular, I'm going to talk first about site-seq data, which has RNA and surface proteins. Um, and I guess here everybody knows what those things are. Um, so um, so what I'm, well, I'm going to talk about two main ideas here. And I guess what makes me different as a statistician than maybe uh, your usual machine learning uh, speaker, is that um, I want to look at whether, whether you, you know, we often predict uh, some features from other features. In fact, we do that all the time. I want to ask, can you do it? Is there enough information to successfully do it? So that'll be the first half of the talk. And then I'm going to talk about um, how to denoise and impute uh, missing features, so I'm going to go ahead and do it, uh, uh, predict things that weren't observed, and try to uh, 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 be able to clean up uh, big data sets and combine them together with a, a probabilistic variational autoencoder. And, but um, I do have, it's not a new trick to me, but it's a new trick to this area using masking to do that better. So these are the things I'm going to talk about. Um, and the main, I normally always work on um, brain cells, but uh, to get a lot of data, I'm using PBMC because there's quite a bit of good quality data here. It's not my area of expertise, though, these, these uh, immune cells. So just to show you how what you get the same and different from whether you have just the transcriptome or whether you look at these surface proteins, is that both kinds of data sets can lead to very good clustering of the major cell types. But the surface proteins really allow you to to identify and separate out some of these smaller and uh, subtypes. And so there really is good information to be gotten from that. Um, and, um, and people care about that. Just uh, This is just a publication using these kinds of protein, surface protein markers. And these are subtypes of uh, cells. And they're, they're important in terms of uh, COVID, whether you're healthy, asymptomatic, or severe. You have way different fractions of these cell types, and these proteins are good markers for that. So that's, that's the kind of reason why people care about this. So, um, so anyway, um, so RNA-seq is really noisy, very sparse, high-dimensional, thousands of measurements, whereas protein tends to be just a 10, 20, or a few hundred, but it tends to be more informative. It's much cheaper to measure the RNA than the protein. And so there are recent papers, relatively recent, on trying to predict the protein from the RNA and various machine learning methods, neural, uh, nearest neighbor, neural networks. And so um, I, I just want to ask the question, is there, is there, can you do that? Can it, can it be successful? Not how should you do it, but can you do it successfully? So this is kind of a busy figure from this paper. But let's pick a particular, this is a particular protein. And now we're going to predict, so this is, uh, this is that protein. This is the truth of its, of its abundance, and this is the predicted value. Uh, when you use the, the neural net. And you see it's pretty highly correlated, pretty nice, and that's what this point says. It's 0.5 is the correlation. But if you use the nearest neighbor method, it's quite terrible. It's actually a negative correlation with the truth, and so that's what's being plotted here, is the, the nearest neighbor method's correlation with the truth. And you can see first that, well, naturally, this paper is by these authors. They pick, they drew out three that theirs worked very well on, and in general, theirs works better. But what 
troubled me about this is that not only that a lot of them are pretty bad, right? Even the good method, a lot of times the correlation's not even above 0.2. So is that really bigger than you'd get by just chance? So that's what I wanted to, to solve. So, um, so this is uh, just writing it statistically. If X is the transcript and Y is a particular protein, can you predict it or is it actually conditionally independent? If we reject the null, it means we can at least have some predictive power. So that's what we want to get. We want to test that. And so, um, and we want to do this in a completely model-free uh, way that would be applicable to very high dimensional data. And we want to be able to use any machine learning method. Like these methods, I love them. They're so powerful, but they're very black box. And I just want to be able to get as a statistician, you want to have a p-value. You want to say, did it work? So that, and, and we can, and it can be your favorite method. So um, what you're going to do then is under the null, your estimate is just the mean. And one, under the alternative, you, f you predict the protein using whatever method you want to. And, um, and so because there's, so every cell is like, pretty, you know, pretty bad, but there's a lot of them. And so you can split the data in half and use half of it. This trick, this trick can be used in many different problems. So I emphasize that this is a technique. Split the data, the first half of the data you train, the second half you calibrate and you can, you can uh, get whether you had a, I mean, that's like kind of a standard trick, but it's being used in a particular way here. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm not, because it is late in the day, I will fly through this. Just this is the test statistic. You say, do you fit better under the alternative than you do under the null? That's what the test is saying. And skipping over all this, it basically says, yes, you will be able to do this. You will get a good, powerful test statistic if the, if the variability in your estimator is less than the variability in truth, how much does y vary based on its predictors? If this varies more, then you can do this, and you'll get a, a small p-value. Okay. So another test statistic is a more robust test statistic, which will tend to work well for these poorly behaved uh, measurements like uh, uh, protein measurements which have a bad distribution. So instead of getting these squared distances, you just count whether you, whether you win or lose a rank sum test. Okay, so, uh, and then um, well, obviously you're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to get a p-value at the end. So you fitted, you fitted it under the alternative, you fitted it under under the null and under the alternative, and then you just permute these and see if you fit better. And um, um, and then this is actually also kind of a nice trick: is that you can use the Cauchy distribution to. Um, you don't like the randomness of having splits. So you split many times, get your p-value many times. You do these calculations, and not only do you get rid of the randomness, but you get a much more powerful test. So this is also a nice trick to keep in mind. So um, finally, it works very well. So as we, we get, we took a, like a, a thousand dimensions and we put a signal in only one feature. So it's a, it's a hard problem. Everything's noise. One feature is predictive. And then we see that as we make a greater signal in that one feature, our method gets more and more powerful. But what's interesting is for this particular test is that the, when, we, when we do the Cauchy version, we get much more power because sometimes the split is bad. And this is good to know that sometimes you can do better by doing multiple splits. And this is just the competitor. And you can see that it holds its power even as we get more and more dimensions. So sparser and sparser. Okay, so enough statistics. So let's like see it in some real data. So this is uh, uh, 
21,000 genes, uh, too many genes. We reduced down to the 5,000 best ones, a couple hundred proteins, and eight cell types. And I want to try to do a hard thing. I want to predict each protein within a cell type. And I could either use these 5,000 uh, most variable ge genes, or I could use the marker genes for each, for each cell type. And, um, and the results come out, I think, actually quite surprising. So these are the, each row is a cell type. So here's, like here's CD4T and CD8T, pretty similar cell types. Each column is a protein. And if it's, if it's orange, it says we were able to predict with 5,000 genes. And if it's blue, it says we can predict with only the marker genes. And surprisingly, they're almost always the same, which seems weird because these are different genes predicting the same protein just as successfully. And then some proteins, any, any, we can do well no matter what cell type we're in. Other ones, we can only do well in a particular cell type. Probably those proteins aren't really expressed much in other cell types. And then some proteins can never be well predicted by our model. And, um, so you learn something there. If you have sparse real estate for measuring those proteins, you better measure these, and these ones you could drop. Okay, so, so to summarize, um, with machine learning methods, the goal is often to predict, but what if honestly there's no information in the features? So this is a way to answer that question. Is there any information? And we can answer that for any machine learning method. Now, I only did a simple one, a random, uh, a random forest model. So when we go back to this, this might have turned out better if I'd used a neural net or, or if I'd done, done it differently. But for this model, that's how badly I predict some things. And... Um, and in general, these ideas are very powerful for when you have large samples and you can split them and, and learn what you can learn. Okay, now, in case you fell asleep, I'm completely changing to the second half of my talk now. So now I'm going to talk about, I want to, I wish I could measure everything on every cell. I can measure the, the uh, chromatin peaks, the transcriptome, and surface proteins on a single cell. But usually, that's pretty expensive. So I might only be able to measure two of these, or maybe even only one of these. And I want to put all the data that I have in, available in the literature, and I use it all together. I always like to try to predict these sort of things like, what kind, how do these things predict for disease and, and uh, so forth? Okay, so, so what, what, kind of, what kind of problems do we have? I kind of like the dogma seek method because it's like they name it that way because it's the whole story from the DNA to the RNA to the protein. That measures all three. People don't usually do that one. These two are much more common, measuring two of the three that I'm interested in. And um, so, um, and these data, as we heard this morning, these data are really sparse. Um, I think actually my student made these. I think these are kind of exaggerating, maybe. Uh, most of the data is zero. And some of those are true zeros, but many of them are zeros, just sampling zeros because there's not very much biological material. So the, the, count, the true count would be small, but not necessarily zero. So some, some denoising would be a good thing. And also, I want to be able to combine the different data sets together. So that's the kind of data that I have. Very sparse, very high dimensional generally. 
and very no very noisy. Okay, so what, why, why do I want to do this? I think everybody in the audience probably knows better than me. I just want to, I want to characterize cell function. I, I know I, I might need all these different things to do that. And, um, and I want to reveal the, the uh, uh, regulatory layers and so forth. And so, but it's very expensive. And not really, really, I finally was involved in actually a project where we were measuring these things, they fail a lot. Trying to measure many things from one cell, lots of times you don't get anything. So, so it's, it's great to be able to get as much from what you have and try to impute the rest. Um, so, um, so, so this is what, this is what we want to do. And this is what the data would look like. This is the data I'll use in my examples today. So I have, I have this, this uh, protocol where I can measure all three things. This, I can measure these two. This protocol, I can measure these two. And I have whole blocks, whole modalities that are missing. But I also have, if you look down here, even among across the modalities, they're not a complete match. Many genes were not measured in both. So there's lots of white cells here, which means they're missing. They weren't measured. And, um, and then these modalities weren't measured. We want to be able to put that together. So, um, so how, we want to know, how can we combine these different modalities to get a lower dimensional representation successfully? And how can we combine these data sets together successfully? And so... Um, um, so, so that's what we're aiming to solve, and um, um, so I feel like I'm not on the page I expect to be on. Sorry. Uh, so um, there's that not having coffee before the talk click kicking in. <laughs> so anyway, we have uh, we have we have two goals. This our first goal is we want to integrate and analyze all modalities and features, and what that means is. I want a lower dimensional representation that comes from all the different kinds of data, and then I can use that, that lower dimensional uh, representation for visualization, clustering, or whatever downstream uh, analyses you want to do. And then the second goal is I want to be able to predict those missing blocks of data. I want to impute, and I want to denoise. So I want this. And I want this. When I started off with this, which has a lot, a lot of bad qualities. Okay, so there, there are of course many methods of it in the literature. There's never a method, never a question that a statistician is the first one to write a paper on. And uh, so, so there are many methods, but they don't solve all of the goals I want to solve. These manifold uh, uh, aligning ones fail in the first one. These ones claim to do the second one, but they don't seem to work. And uh, nearest neighbors is great for the second one, but uh, it doesn't really do uh, uh, the dimension reduction well, and it, it is not really designed for uh, predicting out of the data set and performs poorly there. There's some nice deep generative models that I want to build on, but they themselves, the publications, have not attack that problem. So that's where I'm at. I want to do that. Let me tell you what they did. So these are, these are pretty nice papers. Uh, and this is the idea. They string out the data. They have some covariates too, which is nice. And then they do the latent representation and predict this. The usual thing, the reconstruction error and the KL distance. And, um, and this seems like exactly what we want, except for one thing. When the data are missing, they just treat it as if they don't mark that or flag that. They just treat it as if it's really zero when it actually wasn't measured at all. And that leads to a tremendous amount of bias. And also, we can't predict into those modalities we didn't measure. So what we want to do is use this fact that we can use these conditional independences 
to predict in the in the modalities that we didn't measure, and that seems kind of obvious to a statistician. So, um, so anyway, here we are starting. This is our method, SCV8, terrible name, and um, we want to we want to do this. And what are we doing that's different? We line up our data, but we're going to actually keep track of that some are authentically missing, they really are missing, and we think, well, gee, if some are missing, let's make more of them missing. So let's randomly mask some of our data. So for every, for every cell, we just pick 20% of the data and block them out and mask them, and that's going to help us in a couple of important ways. It's going to al allow us to, we have the same measures, and then we add this piece, the imputation. We say, how well did we impute those missing values? And this can allow us to, to impute these ones better. And also, it allows us to, to avoid overfitting. Now, this is new to this particular topic, but it, they use it all the time in language modeling, so it's not new to us. But it works, works very, very well. That's, that's the main the main trick we have, sorry. One other thing is that it's very important that we can put the covariates in, like uh, treatments and so forth, we can put that in, and then we take it back out, I, we take it out to get this representation. Then we put it back in to get our predicted mean, we need that for the reconstruction, but then we can run this again later and take it out if we want to remove confounders, we can remove them here and then get the data for downstream analysis. Okay, so um, I just want to say, don't look at this, it's too busy, but we want to predict in many, many cases. First, the easiest one is we want to predict in cell types that are different. Then we want to predict in different tissues, and then we might even like to try to predict in different protocols. And those are all hard problems. But the first one, just we held out two major cell types, learned the model without them, and then looked to see how we predicted. And this is, this is our method, the nearest neighbor method, and the uh, uh, deep learning method, the competing deep learning method. This is... Uh, uh, Pearson Spearman correlation, and this is mean squared error. So we want these these to be the biggest, and this to be the smallest. And you can see we either we either win or are tied in performance, and and the performance is quite good. What's really interesting is how terrible the other deep learning method is. It's it's in terms of because they left out those zeros. It's 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 quite bad at the actual prediction, although its correlation is not always so bad. Okay, so now this is predicting into a different tissue, so we measure the same cell types but a different tissue, and this is the coral, so this says our method got 50% and theirs got zero, and so this is the nearest neighbor. You see it's, it's, it's always winning in that. But what's interesting is it's still pretty darn good at predicting those proteins. Um, now finally, this one's way too busy, but let me explain it. This is what I'm really interested in is trying to predict in a different protocol. This is the REAP-seq. So here is just predicting this one, this one, this one, the pale ones. This is our method and the other two methods. And, and that's predicting in a different, um, a different um, tissue. And it's pretty good. It's so much harder to predict into a different protocol. Quite obviously, we haven't really solved that problem. These are pretty bad. Probably if I ran some of these, like for instance this one, if I ran the first half of my talk on that, it would say that that was actually not predicting at all. So it's important to, important to keep that in mind that you might fail. Okay, so that's that. This is another, uh, just another look. Now I'm looking at three measurements, the dogma seek, all three measurements, and I'm predicting, I held out a cell type, and I'm looking to see 
how well do I predict the proteins in this cell type? I have all the other cell types in there. And the, each point is the, is the actual prediction. This is the truth, and this is predicted. And it's pretty noisy, but not too bad. This is our method, and this is the nearest neighbor. And they look just the same, except for one terrible error. And that is nearest neighbor notices that CD4, CD4 T's in the other measurements are very much like, I mean, let me say that again. This protein, I, I actually don't know anything about these, these PBMCs, so it's maybe going to show. This protein is very um, uh, highly expressed in CD8T, but it's not so highly expressed in CD4T. And because those, it predicts based on nearest neighbor, it makes that big error because it learns from the CD8Ts and, and, and grossly uh, overestimates those. Okay, so um, I am going to get done before predicted. So I just want everybody to know that, that we are going to get to our wine and cheese. Okay, <laughs> so okay, back to what I'm showing you. So here what I'm doing is I'm throwing out more and more data because I want a method that works well when there's missing features. And this is just, once again, our Pearson, Spearman, and mean squared error. You can see that our method and, and the nearest neighbor method, they, they're hold, they hold steady, they do well. But the other method that uses uh, deep learning really falls apart and, and, and gets quite bad there. Okay, and this is just showing also when we try to predict the peaks, the same problem. It, these two continue to do well, and, and this one, I don't know which one is it? Let's see. Oh, this is, this is interesting. So the, oh, these colors are too similar. This one is the, uh, um, the deep learning one, it seems like it's doing well in terms of correlation, but it's, it's mean squared. So it's off, but it's correlated, and it gets worse as there's more missing data. OK. So in this, in this one, what I'm showing you is this is the most complicated of all the experiments. So now I'm putting together all the data all three measurements, and then the two, and then the other two. So we've got a whole blocks missing. I, I stick it in, I run it, and I get the lower dimensional representation, and then I do the UMAP. And so the thing is, many things could go wrong there, different technologies, big blocks of missing data. We could get a lot of bias. But so the first thing we look at is, are we, what we want to, and then there's an extra piece to this. There's a condition. There's some data set, some cells have this, this uh, uh, chemical perturbation to them, and others don't. We call those the control and the stimulation. But first, we look to see a good method will preserve the main biological features, you, cap, you reconstruct your cell types. So see, the, all of the cell types are pretty much done. I mean, there's a little orange done here. But pretty much all the, all the oranges there, all the greens there, and so forth. So it, it preserved the basic features. But what's exciting is it did not remove the, the condition. The condition was preserved. These orange points here are the, we expect this condition to show up in CD4Ts and CD8Ts. And these are the ones that had the condition of those cell types. And it's quite preserving that, that perturbation. And um, I'll just ignore the, the, the final column. But this is the nearest neighbor one. It sort of doesn't. It doesn't combine the data sets and get the cell types nearly as well. And this is, this is I emphasize, 
it's the one everybody uses. And uh, this, and then because it used nearest neighbors, it completely removed the interesting perturbation. So, so we, we did lose on that. Um, this is another method. It failed totally for us, but I don't feel certain that that wasn't our fault. Okay. So finally, what, what have we, what have we, what about those modalities that can't be, uh, can't be imputed? Now, I, I got all kinds of typos in that first line, but what I'm trying to say is, I was, I was like still editing recently. Okay. What I was trying to say is, if you can't predict something, what, maybe I shouldn't be predicting them. Well, what, how can I resolve this? Okay. So first of all, in the, in that application, I used a random forest, which is not as powerful, and I tried to predict within a cell type. I didn't really realize this until my student was working on it. Using all the cell types and all these interactions, um, a, a, a neural net can do a much better job and predict. So probably if I ran my first part of my talk on the model in the second half of the talk, more of them would have been predictable. So that's one thing. But even still, people need to check and see if they're getting meaningful predictions when they use these deep learning methods. And they should avoid doing downstream analyses of things that they, they did not successfully predict. I want, I, I, if that's the only thing that you learned today, I hope you hang on to that. So um, now I just got a li I got enough time to tell you about one other real application. So this is we have brains, their uh, autism, uh, people who had autism, and neurotypical brains, and um, and I don't have I don't have single cell data. I have bulk bulk protein measurements, that's mass spec measurements, not surface proteins. So bulk protein measures, and these are measured as peptides. So for every sample, I measure many, many, many peptides. And I don't have that many samples. It's not a huge sample, like a couple hundred. And I, uh, I have a lot of missing data in here, all these white white values. These are the peptides that weren't measured. I want to add the right peptides up to get a protein, but I have these missing values in there. So I'm going to go ahead and use this, this whole uh, method, and I'm going to, I'm going to, to uh, denoise de them and predict the missing ones. And I wonder if that's going to make any difference. It's pretty simple, right? This is much simpler than what I was doing before, but I can put it to a meaningful application. Now, we have, as, as you can see, we have uh, you know autistic brains and neurotypical brains, and I want to contrast those. And the missing measurements, it would bother you if all the missing ones were in one cell type and not the, or I mean one category, not the other. But by design, the missingness tends to match. And so when we're missing a peptide here, we tend to be missing it in its core, in its control too. So we feel pretty good about this imputation that will be safe there. And this, when I say we, I really mean these other guys, uh, Matt McDonald and Bernie Devlin, who collected this data. And so, so we want to apply this. We want to test for differences in, in um, uh, the proteins, and we, because this might be, you know, meaning me, these differences might be meaningful. And so we, um, uh, so this is the volcano plot for when we only use the non-imputed data. So this is the um, the signal, uh, you know, the uh, fold change. And this is the Q value. And you can see when we didn't impute, we got hardly any findings, just two proteins. But once we imputed and denoised, we have a, a lot of signal. I can't say for certain that's true, but we, we did many realistic simulations to see if we were in inducing false positives. It just seems like this kind of analysis, which a person could do in many settings, um, 
uh, even if you didn't have missing data, just to denoise the data this way does help your power. Okay, so to summarize, this mo mosaic integration is going to be really indispensable for combining all these uh, multimodal data sets where we have one, two, three measurements, different data sets, we want to put them together. And we can impute the missing bits and make the best of this valuable data. Um, and um, the other thing is that our, our model does uh, adjust for the batch effects, removes those batch effects, and still maintains the biological variation, which other methods either either uh, uh, ex exaggerate the differences or they fail to capture the true ones. And um, so, so, um, so, so we do think this is, this is a good idea. So let me just give, I am way ahead of schedule. It must be that lack of coffee. So um, um, we, uh, let me acknowledge my collaborators, uh, uh, Jing Lei, my longtime working colleague, and Jean-Ri Kai, who was my postdoc, did the first half, and then the second half by Jean-Ri and my very shy and brilliant student, Jin Hong Du. And uh, so we have these two papers if you want to take a look. And we have s software uh, on the GitHubs that go with those papers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Thanks for a delightful talk. Um, in the deep generative models, the variables, even though they have kind of biological relationships, uh, those aren't really acknowledged. So for example, that, like a taxi at a genes promoter and the RNA of that gene, you might think have a clear relationship or the protein measurement for that gene and the RNA measurement. Do you think it's an interesting direction to try to build some priors based on our biological knowledge into that, these models? That's a very good question. Absolutely a person should do that, but not my student who doesn't know those things. But yes, yes, I do, <laughs> I do think those are, those are a good idea. And I think it's encouraging to see that even without it, that, that this basic principle, I still, I would, I would hate to lose that masking step where we were able to not overfit and 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 improve our model, but if 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 that all that biological information could go in there and improve the net, that would be great. Thanks. Everybody's very eager for their wine. I understand that. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk a little more about the masking, how that works. Is there like an iterative step where you see how well it does on the fake masked data and then change? Like, what is no, it's process? very good question. So the way the masking works is that every cell gets, uh, say, 20% randomly placed. And because there's a lot of cells, we actually only have to run it through once. And then you tune it to, so that... So there's that extra step, which is like a supervised learning part in there. And you only have to run it one time to get the, uh, 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 to, to, to be, be, because, because there's a lot of cells and you got to mask a lot of different things in different places. Like if you run it and you iterate more times, it doesn't really change it. But, um, uh, and then we tried masking like 20% all the way up to 80%. And it just depends on how good the signal is. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter as much as you'd think it would, how much you mask. And, and that is what the, you know, I mean, they've made amazing progress in, in the models in language. And that's what they do. And so it's, it's obviously a trick that, that should be coming into genomics. And um, not in, this is like I always say to my, my students, oh, it'll be easy to do. But I think it was relatively easy to incorporate it in. 
That's yes. wonderful. Um, I have a question about the the false positives. So imputation, uh, you kind of mentioned at the end that you checked for the protein data. Yes. Uh, that uh, you don't think there's false positives, but in general, when there is no truth known, so. When in gen- I didn't. You said in, in general, and then I missed. In general, word. when we don't know the truth, like the yes. BMC data set, um, how do you think? Beside simulations and permutations, one can assess that. We certainly don't know for sure if we don't have false positives. I, I will say that nobody ever knows that. But what we did was we spent a lot of time making very realistic simulations. So we would we would uh, um, uh, a bit built up a you know you know how you can make your simulations very realistic by using the actual data, but then adding a bit of signal on it. And uh, so, so it has all the bad qualities of the real data. And we did a lot of different things with that. And because uh, we, we were surprised by that many findings. And we're not finished yet. You notice that that was a very rough figure. It's not a published thing yet. We're still looking into that. Good question. Thank you. I think I saw one more question. The wine is calling us. 